Hi, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to this uh, panel on immunotherapeutic agent delivery uh, on the virtual focused ultrasound for glabulous tumor workshop. Uh, and it's my distinct pleasure to be with the stellar group of, of panelists and faculty on this program, uh, Dr. Amy Heimberger, who's the professor of neurosurgery at Northwestern, who recently moved from MD Anderson to uh, Northwestern. Uh, we have Dr. John DeGru, who's the professor uh, at uh, MD Anderson Comprehensive Cancer Center. And we have Dr. Patrick Wren, who's a professor and uh, director of Center for Neuro-Oncology at uh, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute of the Harvard Medical System. So good afternoon and welcome to this uh, session. Um, I would actually uh, start off uh, with, uh, you know, Amy, uh, you know, uh, on asking on what are the immunotherapeutic agents which should be studied in this situation? Uh, and what are your thoughts on this since, you know, you've done a lot of work on this in this field? Well, you really gave me a lot to bite off in one quick key question. <laughs> if I could answer that, I think I'd be done, eh? Um, so there's a variety of different um, immunotherapeutics you can consider. The previous session talked about utilizing uh, blood-brain barrier opening ultrasound as a way to stimulate antigens as sort of your initial sort of uh, step in immune activation but you can also directly deliver a wide variety of immune therapeutics. You can do, certainly do um, immune checkpoint ligand um, antibodies. You can do a wide variety of adoptive uh, cellular therapeutics, everything from you know, adoptive T cells to NK cells to um, more advanced chimeric antigen receptor, genetically modified antigen presenting cells. So there's a long list of potential candidates, and I think we're only sadly just beginning to start to prioritize that whole immunotherapeutic uh, compendium. Some things to consider when we select these is that um, clearly one of the advantages of the blood-brain barrier opening ultrasound is the delivery to the central nervous system. So in my mind, if there's something that has a very significant immune modulatory uh, capacity for the systemic circulation, you may not necessarily get much of a benefit within um, this delivery uh, with the blood brain rear opening ultrasound. So uh, an example of that would be a chemotherapeutic that has already very good blood brain barrier penetration. So if your immune therapeutic really exerts a very strong systemic effector response, and that effector response, let's say, is getting great dispersal throughout the tumor microenvironment, you may not need the supplementary uh, blood brain barrier opening ultrasound. With that being said, and having studied um, very uh, in-depth the microenvironment and the way various immune cells distribute throughout that tumor microenvironment, I will tell you that that's not really going to be much of an issue, especially in the T-cell compartment, because T-cells are really pretty confined to the perovascular space. So I think it's a matter of going through the preclinical uh, models, and I, I certainly appreciate some of the earlier comments about the limitations of small animal models and mice, especially the comments by Adam Sonneman. Um, but I think that's the place to start, and then developing a prioritization list of the available immunotherapeutics that are applicable to glioblastoma. Um, some of the ones that we've used for other cancers may not necessarily work particularly well in the setting of GBM and not necessarily just limited by blood-brain barrier opening, um, the uh, limitations of the blood-brain barrier. Um, but that is at least a, a, an initial start. Um, but I don't have a preconceived notion for a lead at this time. But I think John may I actually have some additional comments on this as well. Yeah, no, thanks so much, uh, which, uh, you know, gets us into this very interesting segue. So John, you've been uh, involved with leading an effort uh, in a particular uh, study. Do you want to tell us about uh, you know, your thoughts on that study and the trial design and how do you think uh, that'll help us leap forward in this field? Yeah, thank you. Um, and thanks for the introduction, Amy. I think um, if I interpreted your comments correctly, I think um, you know, checkpoint inhibitors may not be um, you know, applicable to um, primary uh, brain tumors. Um, but I think uh, they, they do work in other cancers and they work in brain metastases. And so for, for a lot of us, that is, I think, a very reasonable place to start. Um, I think, you know, the focus ultrasound and blood-brain barrier disruption um, is, is really giving us the, an opportunity to sort of open up the communication between the systemic immune system and the brain. And I think 
you know, we all know that there's a lot of immune suppression, peripherally exhausted, um, you know, immune cells within the uh, within the systemic circulation, and there's of course significant immunosuppressive microenvironment within the tumor. Um, but the question is, you know, can we come up with therapies um, to really overcome both of those barriers by by opening this communication between the circulation and and the brain tumor microenvironment. So you could think of a lot of sort of very interesting approaches, whether it's it's priming the systemic immune system and then allowing cell therapy to you know to be enhanced delivery into the brain um, and into the brain tumor, or is it locally delivering um, agents or, or therapeutics that can modulate that immune suppressive environment, um, eliminating, you know, macrophages or microglia or, or switching and, and repolarizing them with, with specific therapeutics. So I think there's a lot of really great ideas that can be um, sort of um, um, developed to, to overcome um, the, the issues of immunotherapy in, in GBM. Uh, no, thanks, uh, John, for your thoughts on it. Patrick, uh, you know, you've been working and you've been involved with the new adjuvant approaches some of the times. How do you see that tying in uh, with some of these uh, focus ultrasound trials as, you know, we move forward? I think the data is suggesting that focus ultrasound can affect the immune system is very exciting. But I think the preclinical models, as has been alluded to, are really not that predictive, especially things like GL261. And to jump from that to big trials, some of them are big randomized trials with survival endpoints. It is a, is a big step. And I think before you go that far, I think it would be nice to use some of these new adjuvant surgical trials to confirm that the focus ultrasound and whatever combinations you administer actually does alter the immune environment in a meaningful way before you launch these much bigger trials. I think tomorrow we're going to talk about response and endpoints, but it's not going to be easy to tell if the therapy is efficacious by looking at responses since the technique itself disrupts the blood-brain barrier and affects contrast enhancement. So your endpoints are probably going to have to be survival in some ex to some extent. And those are very big trials. So you really want to know that it's likely to work before you launch into those big trials. Yeah, so, so great uh, comment, which actually uh, brings uh, to the next question. What would be your preferred approaches to confirm delivery of the agent, right? Because... Uh, that's a big challenge, as you alluded to, with uh, a modality like this. Yeah, I think, I think these new adjuvant surgical trials can do two things. It can confirm delivery of the agent and, and delivery and augmentation of the concentrations in a meaningful way. You know, if you increase the delivery by 30%, maybe that's not a useful uh, increase. But then also you can look at the pharmacodynamic effects whether it's in pathway inhibition with targeted drugs or increase in the tumor microenvironment and, and perhaps suppression of the, uh, the myeloid cells with your immunotherapeutic agent. So I think those things would be helped by these surgical trials. I think the other thing that would be nice to introduce is better imaging. So there are now some of these new adjuvant surgical trials. We're trying to image T CD8 T cells and other things. And that may be also a way to get a better idea of uh, the augmentation of the immune response with these approaches. So I'd like to supplement a little bit what Patrick just said and expand upon that. So from the perspective of targeted therapeutics, 100% agree with Patrick's comments. In the context of immunotherapeutics, there's two additional steps we're going to have to take in the context of adjuvant. One is not just a functional enumeration of the cells being present, yes or no, because again, functionality is of absolute paramount importance here, given the immunosuppressive microenvironment. The second is we're going to have to assure dispersal throughout the tumor microenvironment, which I have kept emphasizing recently, which is if we just sample when we send to our pathologists in these adjuvant or window of opportunity studies, just a small area, we're probably gonna be misled into a false positive signal. 
The question is, is where do those T cells, where are they limited? So do they stop at the area of necrosis? Are there certain areas where they don't permeate very well in the tumor microenvironment based on genetics or based on other factors such as hypoxia? Only then, if we can see that the blood-brain barrier opening ultrasound can overcome that dispersal issue, in my mind then, we've really got a robust signal for moving ahead. But if we just biopsy a couple little areas, I'm afraid we're gonna be misled. Oh, no, very eloquent point, uh, I agree, Amy. Um, and now we have got three minutes left in our session, and I know Dr. Isabel Germano, who's on the webinar, would like to pose a live question to the panel. Can we bring her into the discussion, please? Thank you. I think that the question on how to follow the response uh, was already started, uh, and I would like to see if we could elaborate a little bit more on that, because I think some of the limitations that we have is really, beside the phase zero, is really to understand what we're doing with the therapeutics. So I would like to pick um, Patrick, Amy, uh, and uh, everybody on, on the panel's brain on, on this. I can, I can just mention what we're doing with one of our neoadjuvant studies, um, and that's to look at um, um, sort of uh, next generation um, MR sequencing, including CEST imaging um, that Ben Ellingson is looking at to look at changes in pH, sort of to Amy's, Amy's point earlier, um, and then also using some novel PET imaging to look at activation of T cells. And so because it's neoadjuvant, we'll be able to actually look at the tumor tissue and compare that with the imaging um, and hopefully be able to use that as sort of uh, and develop a predicted algorithm for patients that uh, might be treated with this, this approach uh, without having surgical intervention. Uh, Patrick, is Rano making any efforts into looking at this? I think not specifically for focus ultrasound, but I think tomorrow there's going to be a session to talk about how you can determine the response. I mean, one approach is to use the modified Rano criteria where if the scans look worse, but the patient is clinically stable, you keep them on study and repeat the scan to confirm that they're actually progressing before you take them off. And I, I think it's a huge problem with uh, focus ultrasound and immunotherapies. I, I personally think it's not really reliably possible to determine response you're using response as the endpoint. So then you're stuck with things like survival. Because if you can't figure out response, you also can't figure out progression. So, so no. PFS is also not reliable. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, we, we certainly all agree that there are more questions than answers. So with that, I would make a pitch for people <laughs> to join in the response uh, session that uh, you know will happen tomorrow. Uh, yeah, we will have the answer tomorrow. So. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> it's secret right now. We'll sleep on it and have it for you. <laughs> Patrick, we'll, we'll hold you to that. So with that, thank you so much to our distinguished panel for your uh, comments, and uh, we'll, we'll take a short break. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>